champions who never faltered in the fight. He was referring not to a fellow Irishman, but to a Scottish Christian socialist, James Keir Hardy. They first met in Scottish socialist circles nearly 30 years before. Next slide, uh, Mary. And this is James Connolly's card, membership card, uh, for the Scottish Labour Party with Keir Hardy's um, a portrait at the bottom. So this is how close they were. Uh, over the years, however, Connolly would sometimes express um, exasperation and perhaps hostility towards Hardy. But he never doubted his sincerity, courage and commitment. Like Connolly himself, it would eventually lead to his death only months before Connolly was executed by a British Army firing squad. While Hardy has never been forgotten in Britain, certainly not by the trade unions, as these two slides coming up, the first one is of the Miners' March with Keir Hardy in the middle on the banner, and the next one, two more banners. Interestingly, the one to your right shows uh, Hardy and Connolly uh, in his um, citizen army uniform, I think, with um, his eyes on them right in the middle of Lenin. So we have that there. But for long periods in Britain, Hardy seemed to be cast into what the Irish poet Evan Boland has called the shadows and whispers of the past. But a renewed interest came in 2015 with the coincidence uh, of the centenary of his death and the election of Jeremy Corbyn to the leadership of the British Labour Party. Corbyn said of Hardy at the time that his life impressive by any standards, the universal and global vision. The great lesson from Hardy, he added, is the crying need to unite people of very different cultures and traditions. And that's a theme really that I'm trying to explore this afternoon in this talk, focusing on Hardy's relationship uh, with Ireland. Of course, the current leader of the uh, British Labour Party, Keir Starmer is named after Hardy himself. But the task when looking at Hardy, and my task for today, is always where to start and on what to focus. For he was the consummate committed activist, a trade unionist, a founding father of the Scottish and British Labour parties, a member of parliament for some 20 years, a courageous and tireless supporter of the suffragette movement, a journalist, Christian socialist, a courageous pacifist, during the First World War, and an active and traveling internationalist. Next slide, Mary, shows uh, Hardy in 1908 in Cape Town before the Socialist Hall. And the next one, Mary, is the um, report he wrote on his trip to India. And you will see it there that he was firm on racism and would refuse to enter any meeting where any of his supporters were refused entry. But today I will pare it all down to his sometimes uh, fractious relationship with Irish communities, his single-mindedness, which brought him into a conflict with sections of the Irish diaspora in Britain, but also his commitment to the Irish working class, recognised by Connolly and others. Hardy was often described as a socialist evangelist, a stocky, if you show the next slide, please, a stocky, heavily bearded Scot with deep piercing eyes which won attention. They were so piercing, so scintillating with pain and suffering, said one who saw him, which he must have gone through himself and which he saw in others. As another contemporary record, and as this um, next slide shows uh, from a meeting in Trafalgar Square, both in appearance and stature, he reminded another contemporary of the old prophets, John the Baptist, making way for the future. And Hardy's life was indeed one of struggle, determination, endeavour, and as a pacifist, despair. 
as his beloved working class volunteer slaughtered on the battlefields of the First World War, which he passionately opposed to his cost and possibly to his life. His socialism evolved from the burning injustices he experienced firsthand and which he witnessed amongst the working classes of Britain and Ireland. It was underpinned by a Christian ethic. As he said, socialism was a handmaiden of religion and as much entitled to the support of all who pray for the coming of Christ on earth. That was not shared by everyone particularly the priests in Canown in East London, as I will show later. Hardy was born in inauspicious circumstances on the 15th of August, uh, 1856, in Newhouse, Lanarkshire, Scotland, to Mary Keir, an unmarried domestic servant. She later married David Hardy, a ship's carpenter, who were to live in some poverty through David Hardy's unemployment, and blacklisting, which led to heavy drinking. One reason, perhaps, for Keir Hardy's temperance convictions throughout his life, and something he shared with James Connolly and Jim Larkin. Hardy therefore had to start work at the age of seven. And from the age of 10, he was working in the Lanarkshire coal mines. But as he grew into adulthood, Hardy increasingly gained the respect of his fellow miners. And when only 20, he was seen by them as a natural spokesman and leader, but by the mine owners as an agitator, a reputation he was happy to accept. He became an official in a sequence of miners' trade unions, typically traveling thousands of miles to scores of public meetings. To supplement his income, he turned to journalism and would eventually become editor and proprietor of the influential socialist newspaper, Labour Leader, which would publish some of James Connolly's early influential writings. It was perhaps no surprise, therefore, that he should turn his attention to politics and parliament. And it was to Irish communities and miners that he would look for support but it was not always an easy relationship. In Britain, his aim was to persuade the Irish diaspora to support the Labour cause, but invariably found that very difficult. While in Ireland, it was to promote socialism and nurture the Labour movement, where he generally received a warmer welcome. <coughs> but Hardy had an early awareness of Irish people and their communities. The Irish were the largest group of immigrants into Scotland. By the 1850s, when Hardy was born, they totaled some 200,000. They were not only people fleeing famine, poverty and hunger, but included thousands of uh, tatty hocus, the temporary seasonal agricultural workers, taking part in the annual harvest migration of upwards to 30,000 workers. Although most returned home, <laughs> Unlike workers from other parts of rural Scotland, they tended to bring their families with them. Generally, however, the largest concentrations were to be found in the industrial areas of Western Scotland, especially in and around Glasgow. <coughs> to the east of Glasgow and close to Hardy's birthplace was Coatbridge, the birthplace of Margaret Skinner. <laughs> discussed by Mary McAuliffe two weeks ago, which is an interesting coincidence there. Its population in the um, 1850s was 36% Irish and other, they and other immigrants poured into work in the new coal mines uh, and the smelting furnaces of the town. However, this could also cause resentment amongst the non-Irish populations, which could sometimes turn violent. They were seen by some in the labour movement as a threat to trade union organisation, particularly when they and others from places such as Lithuania and Poland were drafted in by unscrupulous employers. You've nipped forward a bit there. Uh, sorry. <laughs> and again, sorry. 
<laughs> were drafted. You have to go back to, I think, no, um, were drafted in by un no, unscrupulous um, uh, employers as, 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 as black legs. Are we going right to the end now, Mary? Uh, I um, thought I was going backwards. Sorry, Mike. Do you know you might actually be able to use it yourself? I think I've solved it, but okay. uh, where should I be? Because I got distracted trying to fix it. <laughs> okay, love. Uh, I'll, I'll try and do it now. No, it's not working. Okay, Hang on. We go back. Hang on, that's gone backwards. Yep. Yeah. So is that okay to tell me where to start? And, oh, are, you, are you pressing it? Yeah, I'm doing it. All right, keep going. Stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start again. When, when from people from Lithuania and Poland were drafted in by unscrupulous employers as blacklegs, Hardy wasn't immune himself to such resentments. When he moved to Ayrshire in 1881, <coughs> he'd offered good opportunities to grow the miners' union in a workforce that included many Irish. But he was soon frustrated when he sought to force a wage increase during a period of rising prices through output restrictions, <coughs> only to find that some Irish miners undermined the strategy by actually increasing output. More broadly, hostility towards, quotes, foreign labour spilled over into xenophobia occasionally with racist undertones. Later in 1887, when Hardy were again brought, when <coughs> blackleg miners were again brought into the mines, Hardy saw it as a direct threat to the new Ayrshire Miners Union and conducted, some would argue, a xenophobic campaign against the immigrants over the next few months or years. Even in 1899, in his evidence to a parliamentary committee on migration, he argued that Sc the Scots resented immigrants greatly and would want a total immigration ban, although no reference was made to Irish immigrants, only foreigners such as Poles. But it was through his um, developing socialism and the mixing with other socialists that talking to moderate such views and to embrace international labor solidarity. Hardy must also have realized that as Irish communities grew and consolidated, they could become natural supporters of the labor cause, only if they could be persuaded to shift their allegiance from the Liberal Party, which had committed itself to a measure of Irish home rule. <coughs> Ever the optimist, Hardy was convinced that when the parliamentary seat of mid Lanark became available in 1888 with his Irish and miners' votes, he had a good chance of winning. He stood as the Labour and Home Rule candidate. But despite winning the support of Irish radicals, such as Michael Davitt, he failed to win over the Irish vote. Most miners relay, remained loyal those who were able to vote, to the, to the Gladstone and the Liberals and the promise of home rule. In some working class area, areas, <coughs> Hardy was severely heckled. The result was a poor third. As one observer noted, Hardy got the worst of both worlds. Few of the local Irish working class supported him. And he also suffered from the anti-Irish backlash in parts of the constituencies, together with strongholds of Orangism. But it would be developments away from Scotland in 1888-89, involving hundreds of Irish workers, that would enable Hardy to take his socialism into Parliament. This was the period of the so-called socialist revival, when radical groups were asking what needed doing to improve the quality of life of the working class. Out of all this emerged the so-called new unionism, which sought to organize the unskilled working class. It reflected a, a growing self-confidence and deep sense of grievance amongst these groups of workers. Arguably the epicenter of these developments 
was the East End of London and its industrial heartland of West Ham. Three iconic disputes involved hundreds of Irish workers. First one, next one, uh, Mary. The so-called match girls strike of 1888. And you see what Engel's comment was on that. And that great photograph of some of the um, Irish match girls that I was able to get. The organizing of the local gas workers. It was the largest gas works uh, in, um, in Europe. And the great London dock strike, the next slide please, of 1889. Uh, the Irish workers taking part in each of these were often from the same households. This radical environment seemed the perfect location for Keir Hardy when the call came from the seat of West Ham South in 1892 with the strong support of the Irish voters, either directly or through the local trade unions. Hardy triumphed. Could we have the next slide up, please? And that, um, that shows really him in 1892 when he stood in West Ham and what he looked like as a working man, as uh, what people said. The next slide, please, is one of the flyers from that campaign. But the loss of support for the, um, from the same Irish community in 1895, was held partly to blame for his defeat at the general election. While James Connolly urged voters to support Hardy, one prominent local Catholic argued that Hardy's socialist views on land nationalization threatened Catholic schools and churches. And a few days before the election, a mass meeting of Irishmen in Canning Town, an area close to the docks, resolved not to support Hardy. And he had, as he had not put home rule at the top of his program, where it looks fairly high up there to me anyway. On the platform, there were several priests. One of them shouted, don't let hatred of the Tories stand between you and putting Keir Hardy out. Vote for anyone to put him out. An accompanying handbill asked Irishmen not to allow Hardy to, quote, put the country at the tail of the socialist programme. The Tory was duly elected. Hardy's response was equally robust. So you say it is a case of home rule first. Well, I can understand an Irishman in Connemara saying that. But here, here in West Ham, it is Labour first. However, there followed another defeat in Bradford East, where Hardy once again failed to convince the small Irish population over his position on home rule. But in 1900, Hardy fought two constituencies in Preston and Merthyr Tidville in Wales. Each again, had an Irish dimension, though with very different outcomes. There were significant tensions in Preston between the Orange and Catholic voters as a result of an exceptionally large Irish population and an indigenous Catholic population. Merthyr Tidville, next slide please, was very different and more receptive to Hardy's reforming platform. It also had an Irish presence many of whose ancestors had arrived in South Wales ports during the famine period. It was also a non-conformist mining constituency with a radical tradition. There was a strong sentiment in the constituency in favour of Irish home rule. In the event, Hardy came third in Preston, but was elected in Merthyr. He was to hold the seat until his death in 1915. So after several parliamentary forays in British constituencies, where the Irish communities had a strong voice, it is evident that Hardy could not take their support for granted. In a sense, he was in a catch-22 situation, opposed by Protestants and Orangemen as a home ruler and mistrusted by Catholics and nationalists for not being a convincing one and a socialist. He was expected to put home rule before all the inequalities that the working class had to endure. And I think he was unwilling to do that. 
But unlike some in the British Labour movement, Hardy always retained a faith in Irish working class, despite his own setbacks. Even at the very moment of defeat in West Ham South, he was reaching out to the Irish working class. He told them that he wanted to stretch hands across to Ireland to join in common cause against the common enemies, the landlords and capitalists. I want to see the people of these islands united in one great final campaign to overthrow injustice, he said. Hardy's first recorded visit to Ireland was in fact two years earlier, in 1893. It was then that he struck up a lasting relationship with a Labour activist who would later become a significant figure, but who opposed Irish home rule, William Walker, who Shea mentioned at the beginning. Hardy had gone to Belfast to attend the annual meeting of the British Trades Union Congress and to launch a Belfast branch of the Independent Labour Party, which he had just helped to form. Despite the divisive nature of Walker's politics, right up to 1912, when Walker left politics, Hardy, the home ruler, showed him considerable loyalty and commitment. He visited Belfast, next slide uh, please Mary, on a number of occasions in support of Walker's election campaigns. This is 1906, as you can see, and to Hardy's left and to our right is a very glum looking William Walker. But he also later followed him to Leith, where he campaigned in Scotland, where he came for him then. But he was also defended him in an investigation into his conduct by the Labour Party following complaints from several British trade unions about Walker's support for the union with Britain as Labour candidate uh, in Belfast. Hardy would later say when campaigning for Walker that on Irish home rule, each member of the party was perfectly free to follow the bent of his own indication, inclinations. It wasn't therefore, therefore seen party policy, perhaps just a party ambition. All of this begs the question again as to what extent home rule was a priority for Hardy, despite his personal support for it generally. As one scholar has put it, it would be wrong to assume that Hardy always prioritised Irish home rule over other class issues. Hardy's seeming equivocation over home rule was certainly not shared by James Connolly. What form that should take would become a fault line between the two of them. But it would not destroy their relationship, even at its most fractious. Hardy had recognised Connolly's talents early on. Though their approaches to socialism were certainly different, with Hardy the evolutionary laborist parliamentarian and Connolly the revolutionary Marxist, Hardy was still willing to nurture Connolly, particularly in the pages, as I mentioned earlier, of Labour leader. And Connolly reciprocated. For example, when Hardy guarded opposition to Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897, which got him huge opprobrium in Britain, Connolly organised a Dublin counterpart. Then in 1898, Hardy importantly funded the launch of Workers' Republic with a £50 loan. A lot of money there. It was never paid back. Even when in the US, Connolly found time to praise Hardy, conceding in 1908 that he had been right to rely upon the trade unions of the Labour Party. But it was Hardy's relationship with and open support for the Irish Parliamentary Party and land leader Michael Davitt, uh, next slide please, uh, that was the most problematic uh, for Connolly. As a socialist who saw it as a limiting bourgeois organization likely to betray the working class, he therefore saw Hardy's courting of the Irish Parliamentary Party as pure opportunities. It would eventually lead to a cooling of their political rather than personal relationship. But typical of Hardy, even his relationship with Michael Davitt would also cool for a while. Davitt's increasing support for the Irish Liberal Alliance when Hardy was seeking to prize the Irish vote into Britain, in Britain away from the Liberals, 
and Hardy in David's eyes appearing to be a danger to home rule after he had declared war on the liberals, threatening slender majorities in some seats. It was only in the last years of David's life that the two were reconciled. And in the last year of his life, during the 1906 general election, Michael David did his utmost to arouse Irish support for Labour, including campaigning in Hardy's constituency in Merthyr. In 1910, however, as storm clouds gathered over Britain and Ireland, James Connolly returned from seminars of political activism in America to find a new figure to contend with, Big Jim Larkin. Larkin had already established himself as a formidable Labour leader during the Belfast strike of 1907. He had arrived alongside Hardy for the British Labour Party conference and to organise the British National Union of Dock Labourers. By 1910, he had broken away from the British Labour movement to form the Irish Transport and General Workers Union and would soon be joined by Connolly. Connolly would later play a key role in the union and in, the 19, and in 1913 would organise an Irish citizen army to protect workers after the police violence during the lockout. In Dublin. For this audience, I don't really think I need to explore the causes of the lockout or really go into that in any depth at all. But it was argued the turning point for Larkin, probably his greatest moment, but possibly also his Nadir. It, was also, it would also draw in Keir Hardy to perhaps his finest moment in Ireland. A key moment came on the 31st of August, Bloody Sunday, when a rally of workers was attacked by police and working class areas uh, ransacked by them. Hardy had already accepted Larkin's invitation to come to Dublin in support of the struggle. He was scheduled to meet strike leaders and address a rally. He arrived on Tuesday after the tragic of events and attended the funeral of one of those killed. Next uh, slide, Mary. Hardy's personal support for Larkin, in contrast to other British trade union leaders, was real both privately and publicly. Both Larkin and Connolly were in prison and an important task for Hardy was to instill confidence in the remaining strike committee. He saw the lockout as an attack on trade unionism generally. He, he, took, he then took the train uh, to Belfast to secure the support of the Trades Council there. While successful, he was pilloried in the Irish press as a typical Britisher, interfering in Irish affairs and especially supporting Larkin, and I quote, a public pest and social danger who had set trade unionism back 25 years. He even had to contend with criticism from a prominent Labour colleague, now editor of Labour Leader, who argued that Larkinism and syndicalism ignored the facts and eschewed common sense. Hardy responded by defending Larkin, the Dublin dispute, and the efficacy of the strike weapon. Hardy was therefore unrepentant. Not only did he, did he visit Connolly and Larkin, but he was, and I quote, conspicuous in the funeral cortege. It seemed that at that moment, Hardy might well have been the, the spirit and embodiment of the strike. Picking up a remark by employers leader William Martin Murphy about starving the workers into submission, Hardy declared at a mass meeting, most of you have served too long an apprenticeship to starvation to be very much afraid of that. In Dublin and Belfast, he sought to direct the minds of his working class audience away from sectarian animosities surrounding home rule towards the threat facing all labour organisations uh, in Ireland. For Hardy, the struggle of the tramway workers was a continuation of the historic struggles of the working class. Ultimately, the strike might have failed in its original origins and Larkin left for the US. But it was a seminal moment in the history of Irish Labour. For M. O'Connor, Larkin deserves to be remembered as a hero for his titanic achievements between 1907 
1913. But for his own intervention at this key moment, Hardy should also be celebrated. Connolly was in no doubt after Hardy's death. Next slide, please. And here is the account of his death in the Scottish Daily Record. And next, please. And this is Connolly's great eulogy, obituary on Keir Hardy uh, in Workers' Republic, which I've copied from Podrick Yates' magnificent book on the last year's year of Connolly's life through the pages of Workers' um, Republic. And in that in obituary, which you, you won't be able to read the detail, but in that obituary, Connolly said, when the vultures of capital descended upon Dublin, resolved to make Dublin the grave of the U unions, James Cardi was one of the first to take his stand in the gap of danger by our sides. And when many of our friends weakened or were led astray, in the midst of the clamour of reviling tongues and rising above it, we could always catch the encouraging accents of James Keir Hardy in bidding the Dublin fighters to stand fast. Nine years later, in 1924, the Irish Worker newspaper carried a cover page eulogy on Hardy as a man above men, lauding the rebel against tyranny and the antithesis of typical Labour leaders. So perhaps some final reflections. Keir Hardy was a complex, courageous, sometimes contradictory, but always committed and passionate man. He was not only a self-proclaimed agitator, but a lightning rod for others. He could also be very flexible, aiming to draw in a wide range of supporters without compromising on the existence of a working class movement. He saw that such a movement needed to be broadly based if it was to challenge the power structures of capitalism. He was therefore prepared to support and sponsor people who he might not, not necessarily agree with, but who he saw as endeavoring in their different ways to make a contribution to that working class movement. In Ireland, there was James Connolly, the Marxist revolutionary, William Walker, the Labour unionist, and Jim Larkin, for some, the syndicalist. Nor was he forgotten in a partition diet. In 2007, Labour Party members in Northern Ireland marked the centenary of the first annual conference of the Labour Party, which had been held in, Dub in Belfast in 1907. The event became a celebration of the life of Keir Hardy, who was described as a visionary whose enduring greatness remains central to the success of the Labour Party and whose example continues to expire, inspire. He really was someone who could cross divides. George Bernard Shaw, a friend of Hardy's, was uncharacteristically brief when talking about Hardy in 1943, some 30 years after his death. Next slide, please. GBS simply said, Hardy, Keir Hardy kept the faith. Thank you. At 35 